Very warm welcome to all of you joining us today for the SEMS APAC panel discussion. My name is Jumana and I will be the moderator. Uh, for the last several years, I've been the SEMS Academic Director at NUS, uh, the National University of Singapore, and I'm very happy to be part of this uh, very dynamic uh, global SEMS community, as are our panelists, our three panelists who are all SEMS alumni. They're all coming in, tuning in from different countries, they're all in different industries, and they're also at different stages of their careers but all of them play a role in their company's human resource development. And today they're going to be, first of all, sharing insights and tips on what's admittedly a seemingly daunting um, employment landscape, but also too, they'll be sharing some interesting uh, information from their own career journeys. So I'm sure you'll enjoy that very much. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce uh, each of the speakers. So I'm gonna start with uh, Rimli Dasgupta. Uh, she's from the SEMS cohort 2013-14. Her home school was uh, CBS Copenhagen and she exchanged at Nova Lisbon. She's lived and worked in Austria, Denmark, Portugal and Germany and is fa in fact is now living in a uh, small town in uh, Northern Germany. Now, although Rimley studied applied economics and finance, she has spent her career in HR and the last six years worked in different talent and career development roles. She's with an MNC in the fast moving consumer goods industry. We also have Doris uh, Shuli, who's from the 2016-17 cohort. Her home school was University of Sydney and she exchanged at uh, BU in Austria. She's lived and worked also in many countries, Canada, Australia, Singapore, Austria, Hong Kong, and currently resides in Shanghai. Now, Doris is at an MNC in the banking industry, uh, where she started off as an HR management trainee. She ultimately joined the China talent acquisition team, and she's now involved in not only campus recruitment, but experienced hiring. And finally, we have um, Mick Matotti, I said that right, who's from the 2011-12 cohort. His home school was also CBS in Copenhagen and he exchanged at Esade in Barcelona. Uh, again, many countries here. He's worked in Italy, Ireland, Denmark, Spain, Austria, and for the last six years lived and worked, uh, living and working in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Now, Mick has diverse experience in both startups and uh, MNCs. He presently serves as e-commerce B2C for a leading alcoholic beverage company. And in his spare time, as I understand it, I had to share it because it's interesting. <laughs> He's a DJ in a few prominent clubs in the KL scene. And he also claims to make a killer tiramisu, but none of us can attest to that yet. So <laughs> uh, these are our speakers. And uh, again, we very warmly welcome the audience and our guests here today. So to start, uh, let's just mention the obvious. We've been living with COVID and its associated impact on economic activity for about a year now. So I think what would be helpful uh, for our audience to know is, have you noticed any changes in either the key skill sets uh, and or the character traits that are sought after and valued? Uh, and as well associated with that, has, the, have there, has there been a change in how applicants uh, have, uh, are filtered? Now this is posed to all of you, but I'm going to ask that Rimley start us off. First of all, thank you for having me. Um, and thank you for the very sweet introduction, Jumana. Um, I'll straightly get into the question. And um, for me, if you ask this question straightly, has the skill set changed because of the COVID-19 crisis? I would say no. However, that also strongly depends on which industry you're in. I'm in the FMCG industry, so we need as much shampoo now as we needed before. Um, so therefore, things have not changed in the FMCG industry. However, I can totally imagine that in tourism or so, that things will be different. Therefore, um, I think it strongly depends on the industry you're in. However, for me, if we look into what roles we're currently recruiting for, the question within the organization um, has become much louder whether the business 
is, is in need of that role. So while before we would have said, this is a nice to have role, we're currently looking to what are the need for the roles and therefore we're particularly recruiting less, I would even say, however, recruiting very specifically if the business is in need for that particular role. And that in contrast therefore also means that if the role is um, posted, then certainly we're looking for those people. And when it comes to the skill set, one important aspect for me, um, not only because of the uh, crisis, but in the last couple of years has been the idea of learning. So uh, to put it with a quote from Alvin Toffler, who once said, um, he's, a, he's a writer and a futurist, and he basically said, um, when it comes to the illiterate of the 21st century, that's not a person who can't read or write anymore, but somebody who's not able to learn, unlearn, and relearn. And that has become even more evident in the crisis because we're faced with challenges we've never had before. And therefore, if there's one skill set that I think everybody should have in this crisis, it is the ability to adjust and learn. And that is something that I particularly look for when I'm search, uh, searching for new talents to join our company. Would anyone else like to jump in? Okay, on that, so maybe I just want to do a quick follow up then uh, on that Rimley. So when you say someone who can really adjust and learn how when you are interviewing and seeking uh, applicants, how is it that they're able to convey that to you? What is your litmus test? Yeah, very valid question. Um, for me personally, when I'm interviewing people, and I'm mostly in the second stage of the interviews of them, they've been through a couple of interviews already. Uh, one question that I particularly like to ask uh, in the European context is, what is your biggest mistake and, and how did you learn from it? Because I think the reflection within uh, one of that sort of a, a conversation sh shows so much. And one thing that has become even more evident now in the crisis that I particularly look for is resilience. Um, and people who are currently on job search due to the crisis or also due to not the crisis you've recently graduated um for me it's extremely important from to find out from these people how resilient they are and there's no better situation to showcase how resilient than you you are than in the current crisis to show that you've been looking for a job for a couple of months and you're still not disheartened, that you still give your 100% when you enter a conversation or an interview, and that you're still giving your 100% when it comes to finding out more about the company and giving your best. So um, I particularly at the moment look into people's situation and ask them, so how have you been coping with the crisis? And there, there's a lot of things that you can find out about the people when they show how they have um, confronted and faced an adversity, which is the current situation that we're in. So that is something that I particularly look for, how reflective they are, how resilient they are, and that certainly shows in how they've managed different situations in the current situation, so to speak. Jumana, you're muted. I'm trying. Okay, thank you very much for that. Apologies. Uh, so uh, maybe this uh, uh, question will go maybe to Mick and Doris then. If we uh, turn our attention more specifically to Asia and Asia Pacific, what advice would you give for those hoping to work uh, in the region in general? And in particular, if they're coming from a non-Asian region? Um, and this is in general, I think this, but particularly at this time. And you're both muted, Mick. Okay, fair enough, okay. there we go. <laughs> I, I, I will uh, combine the first two question. Hi, I'm Mick, nice to meet you. Thanks to uh, Jumana for the introduction. Thanks to Rimli and Doris. Um, so first of all, uh, how it has changed the overall situation with the COVID? Well, of course, uh, there are less, uh, the, the overall pipeline of talent is still there, is still needed, especially for big corporates. Uh, on the other side, it is also getting more uh, competitive because, of course, uh, some other industries are not the same. That means that you are lined up with, uh, instead of only 500 applicants, probably with 1,500 
which uh, is uh, not that a crazy number compared to what you had uh, to in the normal period. Um, so that for sure is getting more competitive. There are less opportunities on other kind of like side of business. But to be honest, one of the biggest changes that we have seen in uh, Asian Pacific region in the last few years is not as much the overall COVID that is changing the situation. It's actually the implosion of the different startups and the overall bubble that was on tech and e-commerce. The overall e-commerce bubble that started in uh, APAC, uh, mainly driven by the venture capitals, Europeans like uh, Rocket, by now are big corporates, are not anymore uh, companies that are starting from scratch, that are kind of like importing talent, uh, uh, no matter where it's from, no matter uh, based on, uh, on the previous experience. So that's one of the key uh, differences that I noticed in the last few years. Um, in terms of uh, advices on how to enter the APAC region, well, first of all, make sure that you know how to do something. That would be the first definition. Uh, number two, um, apply, 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 and apply some more. Uh, it's always a number game, uh, and uh, it's not only a numbers game, it's a numbers and learning game. The more you apply, the more you discover what you have done right uh, and what you have done wrong, and the more chances you have for the next one. Let's be honest, uh, with less than 100 CV, you might be really lucky to get a job, let's put it in this way. Uh, second point for actually the overall APAC region, it's slightly different compared to my previous experience in Europe. It's much more um, dynamic. That means that there are companies that you would never have heard of uh, that would give you the same opportunities as a normal company and structured company that you would uh, target in uh, overall Europe, uh, US, or uh, more kind of like um, Western countries. Given this, uh, um, my advice for actually coming into the APEC region is, well, relocate first, start to know the overall environment, know the culture, and be ready to be kicked out a few times before you can actually get a, a paid visa. <laughs> so that uh, would be my overall uh, recommendation on that. Um, more to come in the next question. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I, I will talk more about the mobility uh, question, uh, part of the question, because um, I know mobility is something SEMCs really care about, but I want to share some cruel, um, uh, cruel uh, reality. Um, in this special period, it, it is quite, um, the mobility is quite limited as the world is more segregated and the immigration office uh, policy is stricter than, uh, than before. And um, even for like my employer, like very encouraged mobility right now is that don't really encourage people to move around. So um, I think some countries have, um, is more open to get uh, other outsiders to come in, but some countries have more strict um, immigration policies. Um, for example, like China, like if you don't have a previous working experience, um, if you have less than two years working experience, it's very unlikely you will get a visa to work in China. So um, do your research, um, uh, get to know more about every country's uh, immigration policy. Um, and maybe I think the easier approach is to start somewhere, um, maybe start somewhere in, in your home country um, and then um, do a international relocation or transfer to get into APAC, that, that will be easier um, uh, during this uh, special period. Um, thank you very much both for that. Uh, I, I do maybe want to follow up just very briefly with, with uh, Mick because uh, one of the things you said is that you should first of all uh, know how to do something. <laughs> Those were your words. So what are some of the things that are actually, do you, do you have comments on some of the talent and demand that maybe isn't uh, uh, completely filled here where people abroad could 
could squeak in. Yes, well, that's interesting, right? Uh, um, overall talent in the uh, that is relevant for the APAC, definitely something that in Europe is not considered all the kind of like design, for instance, uh, web uh, an analysis, uh, analysis, data analyst, uh, uh, hard skills like uh, coding, all of that is always uh, well uh, seen. So if you know how to do something that is actually counter distincting event where usually you have a better chance of somebody also going uh, through uh, this period that to bring you here or at least to start collaborating in a, in a different environment. Being sense, I'm not sure how many people do actually have this kind of like hard skills, right? That, that I consider um, a little bit more rare in this part of the world. Um, one thing that I would actually recommend for sure is always uh, to go on the skills that can get you a hedge compared to other people. And I repeat, there are some skills, uh, especially in web uh, or digital uh, um, performance marketing, CRM, that allow you to actually have, um, to build it up also on yourself without uh, having a, a, a really structured approach. For instance, one question that I would like on, on the overall floor, I, they told me that you can actually raise hands. Uh, I would like to know how many people did actually uh, try to set up a website from scratch with uh, not weeks or the equivalent of weeks, but something that at least required the creation of a database of the purchasing of a, of, uh, a, a domain, uh, some uh, purchase of a template, some coding that you realize that, oh, I don't know how to do CSS. How do I do that? Google it, okay. And then you can figure it out. So that uh, would be my question. How many people do know how I actually do something? <laughs> it's uh, a different perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Mick. Uh, we have a question I'm from the uh, one of the attendees, and that is, how much do you rely on or trust AI when recruiting talent? How high is the chance you might lose actually talented people because AI could not detect certain uh, this is an assumption here in the question, certain keywords in their interviewer CV. Uh, so uh, if any of you would like to take that on. I think uh, both of us, Doris and I, can, can reflect on that from an APAC and from, a, from an overall uh, perspective, I would say. I'll get started with, to be honest, uh, Many people don't believe that because even 10 years ago, people would say, yeah, the CVs are being um, filtered through some keywords and then you take out those five people who come out anyways. Uh, I might uh, debunk that idea because um, our AI is not as advanced, especially in MNCs of the area that I'm in. Um, we still do very much of the um, recruiting based on the CVs and personally, uh, which I personally feel has its disadvantages too. So um, you're, you're having a lot of um, applicants and at the same time, very little time. So I wouldn't say that per se, um, personal or AI based uh, recruiting are good or bad. There is disadvantages and advantages to both. Um, and I wouldn't give too much of a, of a thought of what AI might take out and what, what it may not take out. For me, the more important question is take the time and, and very much like Miguel said, if there's something you're interested in, a job or so, find out what is required for that role. Then use those keywords to find out also what, for example, you could also build up or what experience you have, and then make sure that the CV reflects what you have done. And there, it doesn't really matter whether it's an AI um, tool or a person taking care of it, but if it's a web developer's role, write down, however you might want it, five years of web development uh, experience. That way, either a person or an AI machine, no matter what, will be able to see. So make sure that you use your information wisely and present it well in your CV and forget about whether this is AI or a person looking into it. That would be my advice. Thank you. 
Yeah, this is a really interesting question because okay, so I've never tried AI technology. I would like to see how it works and, uh, uh, you know, how effective that the tool will be. But um, but but for now, I, I won't trust it um, because I can't think about like, you know, the, the, the criteria you're going to put in and to filter um, because I, I think the employers right now are especially for junior roles, are more open to see a variety of backgrounds. And um, I, I think that you can only, you know, uh, filter it by yourself. You, you can see, um, you, you can feel like the, 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 the person, the candidate, uh, whether she or he have the learning agility throughout the experience, whether she has the adaptability, flexibility via the, the, the experience, um, not necessarily all the hard skills um, they put in the CV. So I, I, I will have more open mind uh, when I look, um, when I screen CVs um, and I, I, I'm not sure how AI can do that. On uh, my side, uh, super quick, I don't have any experience with AI, to be honest, <laughs> on, uh, on this field. But uh, I agree with uh, the, both uh, Doris and Rimley. In general, from my side, don't put yourself behind excuses. Find the person on LinkedIn. Who's the recruiter? Find that person and uh, try to kind of like get through with something interesting. If you don't find that that person specifically, find somebody that knows that person that you know and uh, try to build up a, a real connection. Um, the overall just sending CV through systems might work. I got one job like that. It happened. Um, but uh, to be honest, 90% uh, doesn't. So uh, my strong recommendation there is get on LinkedIn, get every opportunity that you have, get on uh, Facebook, get on, uh, ask uh, three people and uh, from each of the three people that you know, ask other three people that might be interested in uh, getting you a job. It's also a natural selection there because uh, to be honest, especially if you're in sales, uh, um, look at Melvin, for instance, it's a natural selection. If you find my name, if you find me as a person, if you drop me a, a, a message, that means that you're going to find the, the specific people that you need within the company that you're applying for or directly out, uh, outside. So my biggest recommendation on that don't rely too much on a company portal. So they, those work, personal connection works better. So not always, thank always you. the present. <laughs> No, you know, thank you very much for that and that very uh, sincere uh, commentary. And it actually leads to, to what I, I, I wanted to ask here is you've mentioned a few ways, uh, some known, some more creative of trying to actually reach the decision makers and companies and, and the, the HR personnel. So other than uh, also hearing from uh, our other guests on these tips, I also wanted to bring up the fact that virtual networking events and community platforms are increasing in popularity. And how effective are these? And uh, are there optimal ways of approaching them? So if I could have comment from you all on this. Who wants to jump in? I'll pick someone as they say, okay, I'm gonna pick you again, Rimley. <laughs> okay. Or Doris, fine. Doris, you were, okay, sorry. <laughs> Absolutely fine. I just didn't always wanna be the first one to catch it because I'm like, the others are also allowed to speak first. <laughs> um, so the question um, about the online network and I love what Mick just said, um, keep your eyes open and you need the job, do your homework. We're currently sitting in a conversation with 37 participants from, I don't know, India, Germany, China, uh, Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, and so on. Don't forget that this is a network that you have at hand. These are people who are 70s who 
who think like you, who have a similar background like you. So use whatever resources you have. And that starts with um, obviously finding out what are the skills that I need and use YouTube. You don't even need to uh, use money or, or um, invest too much money in it. You can just watch YouTube videos and get to understand certain concepts or certain ideas better. On the other hand, use all that online network that you have, especially, <coughs> sorry, at the moment, people are more home. So for them, it's also easier to connect to you and talk to you over lunch or so, which was not possible before. I couldn't have attended this webinar if it was uh, in normal working hours, because I can't say in the middle of the working day, guys, I'm going to take my private laptop and sit there for an hour and just work on uh, another webinar. Um, but uh, I can do that now. So use that time and also um, because this question came up in the chat, how do I um, take up uh, or effectively capture someone's attention on LinkedIn? I think there it's really important to find out what am I going to bring to that person too. So just saying, hey, my name is XYZ, I'm a SEMS alumna, and I'm looking for why it doesn't catch my attention, to be honest, because they're 15,000 alumni. So if everybody started doing that on LinkedIn, I'll be on the maximum of my contacts. So therefore, really look into how can you approach them? What makes sense? For example, you can really say, hey, firmly, I talked to you on that webinar or I listened to you on that webinar about job situations. There you said something that really caught my attention. This is how blah, 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 blah. So you're building a connection to that person. Or if it's somebody you have reached you have not reached out in a couple of months, be honest and be earnest in uh, asking your questions and say that, hey, I've been looking for a job for that and that long time. I'm interested in this and this and this, but don't send your CV beforehand because for me, that's something I might get a thousand CVs like that. So be respectful of the time of the other person as well. That is how you capture my attention, for example one thing because oh Doris no. was that you Doris yeah yes. yeah um I agree with Rimley like fully just the one to add one comment you know um you mentioned that there are a lot of uh, networking virtual events um does it work um if you just attend those uh, network like uh, virtual networking events uh, enjoy the presentation and leave that's not working so, you know, you need to build your presence, you need to approach um, the speakers or, you know, ask good questions um, and connect with the, the people in the events and most importantly, follow up with them. You know, you want to build your weak links. Um, you, you want to, you, you know, exhaust all the resources and opportunities uh, every time. Um, so do follow up, uh, otherwise uh, all of those will be very inefficient. Oh, well, one super quick uh, point. How do you get attention on LinkedIn? Uh, well, I have an example of one person that I hired, uh, um, really interesting, I had one article, he was a designer. Uh, I was actually looking for somebody to do content management. And he had one article that was uh, about uh, uh, digital marketing and numbers in marketing. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Really, then I met him and he was absolutely not able to crunch two numbers in one round. But to be honest, he at least managed to find me. He bothered me until the moment that I didn't accept to have a, a lunch with him that was really convenient under my office in uh, any kind of like possible um, way. And that person at the end, I hired it for content management, um, marketing, but he sucked at that. Sincerely, he sucked at that. It was uh, the best salesman I ever met or one of the top five. Uh, so 
<laughs> at the end, he ended up in sales, but uh, sales and partnership. But uh, to give you an idea, this person, Sicily, I would not have noticed him if he was not kind of like putting at least a show on his LinkedIn. And it was completely fake. I have to say that. But I appreciated the effort afterwards, and I ended up hiring him and uh, having him as one of the top uh, performers. <laughs> Very interesting story. Uh, I'm just going to try to pick one of the questions here now. Um, are companies now creating long-term specific work from home opportunities uh, considering uh, the new, new environment of this year? Any comments on this? If not, we can move on. No one wants to buy. <laughs> oh, I oh, can answer that one. Yeah, I... No, Mick, you'll go first. I always go first. Mick, you go first. <laughs> okay, super quick. Um, I do believe that there are new um, programs in place for sure. If it's not one company, there is going to be another company that has it. Second point, especially at the beginning, uh, to be honest, that the work from home uh, when you're a fresh grad, Oof, that can be fairly difficult, especially in, in the settings at the beginning when you have to learn the overall corporate culture and the way of working. From my side, one big point on this, guys, this is not a race. Always remember when you're looking for a job that if you have two months extra to, to take a job, uh, hopefully vaccine is out. We're not, uh, it might take the exact same time now to find a job that it took one year ago. So even if you lose a couple of months, you're not going to die. Uh, so always keep in mind that, that there are waves and uh, contingencies, but it, 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 it's life. Uh, the, if you don't have COVID, you have uh, the crash of uh, the, uh, the, the real estate market or subprime, and the next one, who knows what is going to be. So it's always like that. Thank you. One comment from a, from a technical perspective, all the attendees can actually in the chat function can say send to, and then you can in a Dropbox define whether you say to panelists or to panelists and participants. And by clicking all panelists and participants, for me it's in German, um, you can actually reach out to everybody. So everybody can read your question too. That would make it a little more interesting unless you don't have that function, but I think that should work. Um, to answer the question, um, work from home opportunities considering the changing scenario post-COVID, um, I like how Doris put it, let's face the cru cruelty of the current situation. Yes, of course, companies are being more open-minded about which positions can be um, filled in which countries. However, it still remains a thing that people have this uh, wish to at some point go back to the slightly old normal and be in the office and meet the other people and so on. So I don't think we're moving towards a situation where everything and everybody will be able to work from home. Um, uh, but at the same time, I agree to what uh, Mick said, it should be a combination of both. And that is also where we see the workforce uh, having their um, opinion working two or three days from home and working two days from the office. This is where the reality is going. So you still uh, connect with your, uh, with your colleagues, but at the same time, you have to focus time at home. Um, that being said, I think it is also one aspect that we sometimes forget as SEMSIs is also the idea of you can hardly be part of a team that works fully from, for example, Germany, while you sitting in Singapore having a seven hours time difference and therefore not being able to also work on the same time pattern. So that is something that is, that is very basic, but at the same time, this is something that we consider that if the whole team is sitting in Hamburg, how do we take up somebody else who will be closely working with the other ones, but not able to have more than three or four hours together to work um, on problems specifically? That is one thought I wanted to add here. Okay, thank you uh, for that. 
Um, I'm just looking at the chat. I was going to ask some other questions, but I see one has been thumbed up a few times. So I don't know that any of you can comment on Singapore. I, I'm the only one here in Singapore, but this is specific to Singapore. Given the current Singaporean climate towards expats, how would a fresh graduate be able to enhance his or her chances to get a job in Singapore? Uh, I assume none of you three would like to take this. <laughs> So, uh, oh, you would. Okay, great. My neighbor up north. Thank you, Mick. Uh, to, to, uh, number one, why Singapore? Come to Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> uh, number, number There's two. the Malaysian. <laughs> <laughs> and number two, get married with a Singaporean. <laughs> no, that's, 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 uh, it's actually fairly tough. Uh, one thing that I actually do believe that uh, will still remain, and then uh, of course, Jumana uh, will know the, uh, the Singapore situation much better than me. Uh, innovative tech startups, they are not going to look too much into your face. And if they have the overall visa and they have the overall status and they are in the little district with all uh, the cool stuff, electric cars and uh, new ideas, that might be uh, a way. So start from uh, who is really more on the ground and might have a really dirty job to be done and if you are willing to take it you might be able to, to enter that would be if i had to take a job in singapore probably that would be my first bet yeah i i can only say so i'm actually not i'm i'm at the university but we have a career services office that <laughs> is always the one i refer to on such questions but in general it's not easy it's it's definitely not easy and and covid didn't make it any easier uh, as well, Singapore has a lot of internal talent. You know, we have, I, I teach Singaporeans all the time, very, very bright uh, students. Uh, and they are also always bringing in external talent. But I think one thing that for a fresh graduate, uh, it really helps to be in the location because the connections and meeting and understanding uh, is helpful. So um, I, I, I know that's been mentioned before, definitely here. Um, the other thing is also it depends on the industry. Certainly there is a, uh, a tech hub and it is still a magnet attracting other uh, others. So if there is talent and good ideas and uh, effectively connecting, uh, which also has been brought up today, really finding out who and what and what their needs are and approaching them um, through the various uh, other platforms and channels. So uh, that's the best I can do for you. Uh, and Singapore is a wonderful place to come to. Don't listen to others. Uh, OK, and I, very briefly, because this question keeps coming up uh, here, is uh, this goes back to your, end, uh, your, your comment, Rimli, where you, you mentioned the question about um, what is the biggest failure or issue you've had. One is asking, where is the line between uh, being honest and putting off the interviewer. And can you give an example uh, of that? Do's and nots. Yeah. Um, the thing with that question is, um, can I do it? Okay. Um, I'm always getting distracted by the chat function because I'm starting to read without <laughs> even <laughs> having to read. And then I'm like, what was I saying? Um, so for me personally, that's also a very interesting question when it comes to internationality. So in the German market, this is something we ask every single person and we ask them to be honest about it. At the same time, I do know that the Asian market is more about face keeping, about not uh, telling about I made that huge blunder or so. Um, so I think that's a bit di differentiated. Maybe Doris, you could also get a bit on the on the APEC region, how you also handle that. When it comes to the German um, market, um, what I personally, for example, enjoyed a lot. One person once saying, um, and that was very recently, I used to be a person who took quite some time to actually get started with a task up until the point where I got feedback from my boss that they needed things to be um, submitted earlier. And the idea is not about what they said, but the more important aspect is 
what did they do after receiving that feedback? And that is where the whole idea comes up because then she said, okay, well, I was somebody who at school and, and university always used to be somebody who did that last minute. But I, for myself, realized that if I take my deadlines to the last day, I will only do it on the last day. So I tweak my calendar accordingly to make sure that the deadline comes way before. So in my head, I am much more uh, diligent with getting that done by Tuesday and not only by Friday. So this showed how the person took that feedback very honestly and, and constructively and then changed their behavior. And that also applies to you. Take an example. Don't take the example where you crush something completely. Um, it doesn't make sense to put that time into it. But take something where you received feedback, took that up, found this to be reasonable, and then changed your behavior for your future work ethics accordingly. I think that is the example that you should give, one that you really could adapt yourself to, which then shows again that you learn from an experience. And let me, let me tell you one thing. Of course, it's a very difficult situation when you're in an interview and you really want that job and so on. But at the same time, showing your human side always has a benefit because it shows that there is something to you that makes you honest because there's nobody who can do 100% of every job. So therefore being human while keeping that balance of what you learn and how you improve is what we're looking for when asking this question. Thank you for that. Um, oh, Doris, you wanted to comment? Yeah, um, I think you should uh, think about what's the purpose behind us asking the question. The purpose is really to test the your ability to reflect yourself so at a meeting mistakes and having a plan to move on uh, can demonstrate one person's um you know learning attitude right so um i think you you, you should have um you should give uh, the the example of mistake that you can really have a good analysis about um why I made the mistake um, and um, what's the lesson that I learned from the mistake. Uh, what I did after um, I realizing the mistakes and, and the failure and uh, what the mistake led to uh, where I am now. So if you can have that, um, I, I think that would be a great answer. Yeah. Just like Quickly, I think uh, that's one of my favorite questions as well. I always ask that. Uh, to be honest, I don't uh, use the word mistake. I use a situation that went completely wrong. Um, that uh, usually it's a little bit more generic. One of the key points is definitely the ability to take the feedback and if uh, the person has learned the, the, and adapted the, the next time, the, the next, um, well, I learned the lesson from the, the problem. The second point that I take a lot of attention on is the use of I, we, us, them, uh, it. Uh, uh, if you take ownership of the overall situation, even if you were not directly in charge, that's a big plus. So it's uh, literally on the language that you use. It's not what you say. Sincerely, most of the time, I don't remember what went wrong. I just remember this person just blame it on somebody else or it uh, took ownership. And, that's pretty much it. So it's how you say things is not what you say. Thank you all for that. Very helpful. Uh, there is another question bringing us back to AI, and that is about the interviews that some companies are having where the first interview is recorded. Um, and the question is, how would you recommend preparing for such interviews? Doris, is that, was that you? <laughs> but you're on mute. <laughs> oh, it wasn't you. Okay, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone I wanna... I okay. question. Yeah, okay. I, think, I think for all the questions, uh, for all the interviews, um, no matter it is uh, AI or a face-to-face -face interview, I think the most important thing is to be precise. Um, uh, you know, you, you, you demonstrate your ability to deliver a clear, precise, to the point, focused message. 
and I think it, maybe it's it's very important for the the recorded interview as well because the interviewer, I I, I never had the experience of um, you know having the inter um, the the interview recorded, but I I I can think like the. Um, the, the recruiter will see so many inter, uh, like uh, uh, videos um, that you you, sh you you need to be um, you need to be really um, you, um, having a good um, robust um, precise clear message to capture their attention and to really you know showcase yourself in a very short uh, period of time. I think that's the key for every kind of interview. I would quickly like to add to that what Nick and Doris already said, practice, practice, practice. And then if you're done with practicing, practice, practice, practice. The more interviews you've done, the more you've talked to that uh, machine, the more you've talked into the laptop, the more confident you will become and the better you will be able to reflect on, was this precise enough? Was this what I wanted to convey? So use as many opportunities to use that, um, to, to practice that, but at the same time, also make sure that you're giving it at enough, enough time. So don't waste an opportunity for having an interview by just saying, oh, this is a role I don't want anyways. I'll just apply so that I can on my own uh, books just say today, 24th November, I apply to two companies. Take the time to really focus on what is required for that role and maybe even if you want to slightly exaggerate to also see how how you would perform in this. Maybe do a little more, do a little less, find out different ways of putting your CV or doing things to be earnest in your approach to how you want to do it. And then you will find out what your way of coping with these difficult situations with they are when you have to talk to a machine. Um, get your own coping mechanism of how you can take care of your ner nervousness, of how you can be precise in that situation. From my side, uh, we had uh, only one company we asked for a video of uh, introduction for an internship um, that was Damakan, that was actually a fairly good company as a startup uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, one of the first Y Combinator um, companies from uh, from Southeast Asia uh, to be accepted in that program. Quick point, we got all the different kinds of videos. Uh, there were people that were kind of like super, uh, super shy. Uh, we had one guy that instead spent pretty much one week of his life to this video that uh, prepared uh, a cardboard with the bus to, with written on Damakan. I mean, at the end of the day, we decided to hire the guys that put the most of himself in the video, even if it wasn't the best candidate. And we sincerely thought that he was crazy and we spent a um, few hours laughing at him uh, before. And one of the certain point, he actually uh, re-touched base with us because he was seeing the videos uh, on YouTube that were going up. He got 500 visualization within one week because we uh, in the office were actually laughing at him and at the end we ended up hiring him. So anything that gives something about yourself and be noticeable because sincerely that's the only chance that you have you have uh, 1000 people you might be noted badly good or in a good way but at the end if you don't grab the attention there is a high high chance that you are not even going to get to the next one so try the worst case scenario you lose that that opportunity you get the, the next one and to be honest you might also skip that side if you are good enough in networking I quickly want to just add one point to this that also applies to the CV. For the CV, also don't take the typical black and white thing that just doesn't stand out. Use the CV as your um, business card. Your CV is your business card that you're sending to the others. So use it to your to, to find out what you're good at, what your what is unique about you, where you did something amazing that maybe not everybody else did and use that to reflect in your CV. So both in terms of visualization of your CV and at the same time putting the content in it, use your CV wisely. 
put ask your friends and family and mentors or people you worked with to review your CV, to, to ask them, what was your first impression when you saw my CV? What caught your attention first? By asking those questions, you can actually understand how your CV is perceived. And that is also one important aspect to make sure that you're being noticed when you send your business card, which is your CV. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, there is a question that's also uh, gotten some traction here. It was directed toward uh, Mick and it's asking how you develop the hard skills needed in digital marketing environment, um, given that you were in uh, international management and a few, uh, uh, another um, audience member has replied, you know, learn online as, as some of you have mentioned, you can add to your abilities using uh, a number of different uh, mediums, which he's, he's mentioned or she's mentioned. So if you uh, want to add anything more to that, um, uh, Mick? Well, one of the key problems that you have in uh, setting up your, your shop, right? Is that you're going to miss traffic and that's one of the key points that you should actually solve. Uh, unfortunately, performance marketing is based on capital. If you have a capital, that makes a perfect sense to, to get it out. Nevertheless, uh, how to make sure that you actually get some sales, perhaps that's exactly a good life uh, project because you might don't need that, that, that much money at the beginning. And in terms of entrepreneurship, start putting out things out there, um, work incrementally, uh, work with uh, the overall idea. I need to go to the next level, not only for, for making uh, something for me to learn. Learn is not an objective, money is. In the companies, this is a really important message that you should always have at the back of your mind. Yes, learning is a mean, is a something that is important, but at the end, if you want to be successful, you need to have somehow either cutting cost or supporting somebody that is doing uh, money or directly making money. So these are pretty much uh, one of the key points that I would put. How can you actually learn? First of all, put the right objective is not learning, is money. So make money. If you can sell stuff on, uh, on the web, that's already a good thing. That's uh, something that will definitely catch the attention of anybody you speak with. Something like, what uh, do you know how to set up a campaign in so Facebook? Well, I tried, but didn't make that much money. And uh, to be honest, I didn't have the investment. If you start to say, ah, I've done uh, 10,000 uh, euros uh, with uh, this uh, stupid website uh, selling uh, tiramisu, for instance, that definitely catch my attention. I, and I can assure you that uh, after you have done the first uh, 10,000 euros out of that, Believe me, you're going to respend uh, 3K to make other 20. So perhaps at that point, you won't even need a job anymore. <laughs> I'm just like uh, pushing that up a little bit, but that's kind of like really important to always remember what's the end goal. And the end goal in most of the companies and corporates is yes, uh, the well being of the people, yes, the sustainability. But the reality is one of the key objectives is actually to make money. So start from that. Okay. Thank like you for that. Very... Yes, please. Sorry. Very quick one. Also, very valid point for make. Also, highlight your accomplishments in your CV. If you've quantified, if you have quantifiable accomplishments within your current job, use them also in your CV to show. I reduced the cost of XYZ by so and so much percent. I increased so much money by so and so time, which makes it quantifiable to understand where your talents lie in that regard as well. Because at the end of the day, it is about how you improve the business to make more money, to be honest. Thank you both for that honesty. Uh, <laughs> uh, a cruel reality, as Doris has mentioned <laughs> before. Uh, or, so I actually, we are nearing the end and there are more questions and I had wanted you all to speak about your journeys a bit. Now it's, it looks if I can actually ask you all very quickly, each of you to comment on maybe some lessons, uh, you know, parting advice you can give given your, given your journey, um, please. Doris, could you begin? 
<laughs> sure. Um, I, actually, I, I think I'm at the uh, uh, still very um, uh, early stage of my career path, and I'm still exploring um, my passion. Um, I, I did a lot of, um, I, before I, I'm, I'm at my current position, before entering the job market, I did a lot of internships in the past. Like I did sales, business development, um, business analyst, account manager, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and during all of those uh, experience, I, I realized I, I'm most passionate for the people related um, stuff. Um, I'm passionate for, you know, uh, identifying talents and also, you know, managing talents and also um, helping talents to, to develop. Um, so I think um, um, my lesson learned is that um, you really need to be open to um, opportunities you know, give a try to things um, you don't know. Um, and don't, um, you know, how do you find your passion in the first place, right? I, I think most of us don't know what exactly we want to do at the beginning of the career. Um, you, you, really, you really need to just get yourself um, somewhere. You just start doing it and then you explore then you uh, find out what do you uh, really want to do, really loves to do. Um, um, I, it's just that during the process, you just don't make the, 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 don't be preoccupied by a lot of assumptions um, because when you start doing something, you will realize, oh, that seems like fancy, but actually I don't like it. Um, it, it seems really boring, but actually it's quite interesting to me. So I think you really um, need to start um, exploring your, uh, your journey by um, trying new things, um, welcoming all the new um, experiences um, and uh, capture it when it comes. So that will be my advice. Thanks. Thank you. I'll go next. Um, so for me, my career path has been very interesting as well. I started as a uh, in STEMS and I did applied economics and finance and was completely numbers driven. And then I did a U-turn and I did an internship with the United Nations in HR. And that's the first time I actually got confronted with HR, which was nine, seven years ago. And after that, there was no looking back because I enjoyed HR so much because similar to what Doris said, I enjoyed uh, working in career development and talent development and by that enhancing the experience. Um, so for me, very similar to what um, Doris said um, is um, to always continue to finding out new opportunities on the go. Um, you might find out somewhere that something is shaping up and there's a beautiful um, 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 picture of it. Don't be a window opener, be a door knocker. Um, a window opener is somebody who looks outside and says, oh, the weather is great, so let me just go out because there's some preconditions that we take into account. A door knocker, however, is somebody knocks the door proactively and looks what's inside the door and, and the room. And that makes it possible for you to find out completely new things. And here as a SEMSI, and that has been one of the most important aspects of my uh, professional career is use your voluntary work and, and personal engagement as well in that regard. So if you're in some area and you might have the opportunity to do something on voluntary work that is related to marketing, which, which you've never studied, use that opportunity to find out Without having, to, uh, without having to go through the process of applying somewhere, without having go through, to go through the stress of, oh my gosh, what would happen if it doesn't work? Take the opportunity to use your voluntary work to enhance those experiences. And then you might also find out something within that voluntary work, which you can do easily at the moment, also digitally, to then find out where your passion lies. And one aspect to passion it always seems so daunting to find out what your passion is. I would break it all down and take a piece of paper, take a pen and find out what are the things that I'm good at? 
What are the things that I could get good feedback on? And what are the things that I enjoy doing? What is something that I enjoy doing Monday morning? Finding out those aspects will then lead you further into what is my passion. That is what I would like to give you all as an advice to keep that in mind. While you have the time at the moment, reflect while you're at home. Thank you so much. And Mick, if you could uh, quickly wrap us up with your sure. advice, your pearls of wisdom. Uh, yes, I have uh, five things, uh, so it'll be super <laughs> quick. Uh, building up on the passion, know yourself. Uh, number one, know what actually drives you. Uh, for me, it's excitement. That's why I also ended up being a DJ because on the job, uh, I was mainly stressed, not excited. Sometimes also excited. Uh, but definitely knowing what motivates you is really important. Number two, in terms of uh, long plan, do not waste any time. There is not a, a clear uh, career path. There, whatever you know about now, it won't be relevant in the future. Whatever you think it might be actually good for now, it will probably don't be relevant. You might lose some good opportunities, but that's life. Uh, and that's pretty much what, uh, what happens, um, knowing that actually a job usually shouldn't be everything you got because at that point sincerely there is no other way of going forward uh, on this one just a really quickly two quick point loyalty is overrated uh, especially on uh, on company on people is different uh, always be loyal to the people that uh, put the time aside for your growth that uh, spend time for you that's a good, uh, good idea usually. On the company, I know companies are companies, right? Uh, it's a different. Um, in reality, uh, I'm a little bit exaggerating on this. Uh, you still need to find the right balance. Companies are still important, are made by people. Uh, shiny things, be really careful about shiny things. Uh, think about the bloggers, influencers, uh, all those kind of things, really nice uh, social media. Really nice, not core. You are at the bottom of actually the overall uh, pay, payroll. Um, that's usually how it works. Shiny things as they come, as they go. Last but not least, and this is the most important that I got in my career as a person and uh, from the colleagues is actually positivity. Uh, you are spending uh, between eight to 12 hours a day in one place doing usually really difficult things uh, where there are always a lot of problems. Nobody likes uh, to hear uh, negative things. Nobody in any context ever. So always try to be positive. Whenever there is a problem, try to solve it positively. Is not, nothing is good, it is not uh, too difficult to be done. Just uh, accept how it is and be positive because the people next to you are the most important that, that you have uh, in your life, not only in your career. So that would be it. Thank you all, really, from all three of you, wonderful pearls of wisdom. And thank you for uh, rounding us out with this. So to all the organizers, thank you <laughs> for this. You're amazing. It's wonderful being part of the SEMS community. Uh, so impressed with how these three uh, still very young they don't see themselves as young but i know better three very young people are are sharing from their heart uh to all of you out there in the sense community so again all the best and thank you so much to everyone